If you remember that sound, you are officially old. That's right, you're old. Um, that sound is the sound of a phone modem on a computer connecting to another phone modem in another computer to communicate. This is before the internet. The internet officially kind of came of generally available to everyone in 1993. So um, I think at least kind of in our area, um, it varies from place to place. So like if you go out to California where there's more universities and more colleges, uh, obviously it was a little bit before 93. But in our area, I want to say it was around about 93 because I do remember getting onto uh, the internet through Redbird. Uh, or was it Bright House? I can't remember, but I want to say it was Redbird.net. Um, and that's who our internet service provider was at that time. Again, it was a dial-up connection. So, kids, um, you have no idea. Was it Redbird? No, I bet you it was Bright House. Let's find out. Da, da, da. Yep, Bright House. In the days of old. So, yeah, you would use your phone modem to connect to the internet. And then once your computer was connected to your internet service provider via phone, then you could open up your browsers. And the browsers back then were the days of, do you guys remember? Uh, internet Explorer was still around, but there was a rival for this. Y'all remember Netscape, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we're not here to talk about the early ages of the internet. We are here to talk about the days before internet. Now, phone modems um, before the internet came to the area, uh, again, being the techie person that I am, um, I actually, let me take my headphones off so I can hear my own voice better, um, I actually operated a BBS. Now, some of you who are probably a little bit techie know what a BBS is. Um, some of you, you know, it's not that, it's not that, it's not that. So it was sometimes referred to nowadays as an eBBS, uh, but even that has gotten away. Um, let's see, here we go. Um, virtual BBS is what I had used for my software on the days I was running a BBS system. Um, yeah, there it is. You can still actually get it, um, but it's only available for DOS. So if you're gonna run it, you're gonna have to run it through a virtual machine. Don't ask me how that works. And you're probably going to have to use Windows 95, Windows 98. That's how old it is. Um, you know, so you can still, um, if you want to take a trip down memory lane, uh, or if you want to know what it looks like, um, that's what it was. But let me blow this up and show you. You know, kids today, and kids, by kids I define anyone that's a kid that's younger than me <laughs> by at least 10 years. Um, kids today have no clue. Um, they jump on their Xboxes, they get on their Playstations, they get on their gaming computers, they compete with people all around the world instantaneously. Um, yeah, back in my time, when we had BBSs, BBSs were not online. Now, your computer would connect to the BBS that was closest to you, hopefully, because I hope you weren't paying for that long-distance phone call. Back in the early 90s, you know how expensive that was. I can remember one month getting a thousand dollar phone bill and I about my pants so yeah um, so you would call into hopefully a local BBS to you that was at a local phone exchange so you didn't get charged with a long distance call um, and it was all done in fancy graphics and text there was none of this <laughs> none of it this was it and this is even being <coughs> very um what's the word i'm looking for this art is being very colorful um most of the time you didn't get this type of color you got 
you know, you might have gotten the 16 colors, but most of the time it was just eight. Um, and you would get words, um, or you'd get a picture like this. That's called ANSI art. Um, for those of us who are really, really old to the days of the Commodore 64, you remember playing strip poker. You were absolutely thrilled when you got her shirt off and realized, damn it, she's wearing a bra. Um, so yeah, and you worked extra, extra hard. And on the Commodore 64 strip poker, she cheated. She cheated a lot. You knew she cheated, but you couldn't prove it. And damn it, it was a game. There was nothing you could do about it. But yeah, there you go. Can't see art. This is how the old days were. Um, and then, like I said, this was, you know, that was what it was. So, yeah, all you kids and gamers out there, um, yeah, you have no clue. Um, if you had to go back to the early 90s and deal with the Internet back then, no, you're still playing. Well, Atari is fading out. Nintendo is starting to come in. And television is still around but yeah online game competitions playing against other players that was not on the same game console as you nope however before the internet there were games that you could play against another person so let's go back to the days of BBS's and with that you could play wonderful games um, like Brie. Brie was one of my favorite games. Um, at that time, Trade Wars is another one. Um, Trade Wars was the game that gave birth to just about every other, in my opinion, every other sci-fi based trading econ type game. Trade Wars, um, you started off with a little, basically a shuttle pod, um, and you ran from star base to star base. You buy it high, or you buy it low, sell it high, make some money, buy some fuel, and you had to do it with one, never getting caught by pirates, two, taking into account the cost of fuel, and three, you only had 30 turns per day. 30. That's it. You get to move your ship 30 times, the end. Um, and you could play that against other players in the same BBS computer. So I could be playing against my wife if she was, you know, also playing the same game. Um, and so if I came across her ship, I could blow her ship up. So when she signed into the BBS, she'd find out she'd be greeted, goes into Trade Wars and be greeted with a destroyed ship. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, how's that for you? It's not an instantaneous result. You don't get the results until you sign in back later. Bree was worse and more addictive. So, in the game, in days of BBB or BBSs, not only was you calling into your own local bulletin board system, uh, playing the games, reading your email, checking um, news, because news was available for some of us. Uh, I was attached to four, three different networks: uh, CastleNet, FidoNet, and can't remember what it was. But every night, my computer would call another computer. We would exchange information. This includes your games. So, on Bree, um, you get 30 turns, roughly, sometimes 15, depending upon how the sysop handled it. Um, if you were in a multi-node game, which is one computer here, one computer here, and this gets really, really tricky. Um, so, your attacks that you're sending out could take days not seconds, not milliseconds, days. Because your computer that you're connecting to would have to be connected to an upstream, and then that computer has to be connected to the upstream, to that one, and then it reaches the top tier, and then of course your packet for your attack is going down that stream. To get to the computer you sent the attack to, you would get the results, or the, the attack would happen. You would have no idea if you won or lost um, the amount of damage you took, uh, anything like that. You would have no idea until the status report of that attack came back the same way it went up the chain, back down the chain, in the computer that you were there, and you signed in 
four, five, six days later. You have no idea if you won, have no idea if you lost. It cost anxiety to no end. Uh, but, oh my God, it was fun. Um, because your network that you were connected to, and you could run multiple versions of Bree. So if you were, you could have a FidoNet Bree, you could have a CastleNet Bree, you could have, um, you know, whatever network. So you could run <laughs> games any which way. But it was a decentralized system. Well, it, I don't want to say it was decentralized. Um, but it's not like how the internet works today. The internet worked kind of like a, a spider web. So when you send an email from your computer, um, it goes from your computer through your ISP's computer, your IS computer, ISP's computer who's sending that email, talks to the next five computers. Are you open? Are you open? Are you open? Are you open? The first one is open, it sends it here. Then that computer does that. And it's all instantaneous. It's, it's like, I, I don't want to say instantaneous because we've all seen that email that get lost in the ether. But that's what it does. It goes from one, one web, one nub, nah, node, talk today. It'd go from one node to the next to the next. And the computer that that email is looking at, it checks with 5, 10, 15, 20 other email servers. Are you available to pass this on? Are you available to pass this on? Are you available to pass this on? Are you available? Yes. And it sends it that way. So your email, and this is why I always tell people email is the least secure, the least secure, least secure form of communication uh, because that email will literally go through 30, 40, 50, can be 100 other computers before it gets to that destination, before the other person is able to read it. Um, Bree worked in the same way, but it used up down ladders, uh, kind of like a family tree, uh, just top down. Um, so your very top was your main absolute server. That was your top tier server. Um, and you had no idea really where it was located at unless you were looking at, you know, um, the routing network. Usually I think I was down on tier four, tier five on my BBS. So yeah, uh, back in the old days. Uh, and so, like I said, you're sending an email, you're, respli you're replying to a post. Um, unlike face or like Facebook, we had social media. Just It wasn't called social media. They were called Usenet. Um, and so someone from California could post something and it would eventually arrive to my computer about five days after they posted. You would type your reply to it it would go back through the chain. Um, again, where the decentralization part comes in is, so the person I connected to to pass my information on to from my computer, they would have the reply within day one. Who they passed it on to would be day two. The next person they passed it on to would be day three. So it would filter that way, but the times, you would always have to look at the times. And so when you were slightly, like if you signed in for your local BBS and checked your message, um, the timestamps is going to be different than what would happen if you looked at your California server because uh, it took five days to filter through the system. Five days. Sometimes four. If, Like I said, it just really depend on the sysop on how they wanted to operate their BBSs. But there you go. The days of old. Um, and these are quite colorful. Um, but a lot of the time, they were just straight up black and white stuff like this <laughs> so kids um, yeah if you lived in our generation yeah this is what you got of course you know this is what you're looking at and like I said I can't remember everything from that time you're talking about 37 years ago well roundabout um, because I think I ran my BBS about a year before my oldest was born, so it would be about 29, 30 years ago when I ran a BBS. Um, I can't even remember the name. Um, that's how long ago it was. But I know it was kind of castle themed, and I had a val I had handwritten a validation script because I was running a adult oriented. Yeah, no, it was just keep kids out. Um, but when you signed up, it would go, you would go through a custom-made script that I made called the Gatekeeper. Uh, and the Gatekeeper was in charge of validating um, your age, 
um, and stuff like that. It was kind of very sophisticated for its time. It was like, I don't know, 5,000 lines of code um, that I wrote to do this. So it would check your age and then it would ask you some other questions and it would come back and it would ask you for your age again or the year you were born <coughs> and they would do the math on the backside to see if you were telling me the correct age or not. And so you really had to be smart about it. I mean, it was really more using psychology um, to trip you up. And if you tripped up the gatekeeper, you didn't get in. Um, you know, then you're going to have to call me and show me ID. Uh, but the gatekeeper was a pretty cool program I wrote. I wrote some things through the years. I am not a programmer by any stretch of the imagination. Um, about 20 years ago, I actually wrote my own social media website. Um, it was functional. It wasn't the pretty thing. It had about all the 30 members on it at that time. Uh, and it worked quite well. You know, kind of like how Facebook works when a new post was posted. You got a notification on it. If someone sent you an email, you got a notification on it. You could reply back and so on and so forth. You could include pictures. Um, so, yeah, um, days of old. Um, yeah, you could do all that sorts of stuff. So, kids today, you have no clue. No clue whatsoever. If I put you in a game like this, you would absolutely horrifiably die. Um, simply because you would have to wait, you know, it could be anywhere between, if it was a, if it was a network game, two, three, four, five, six days before you found out. And each, for a brief, perfect example of this, each computer node was its own solar system. So, you know, the next one up would only take a one day attack. You know, so your forces would go from your BBS to the next one up the chain. So it took a day to travel. Uh, results would happen on that computer, and then it would take a tr day to travel back to you. So yeah, so the further away, the farther away you were doing it, um, yeah, the longer it took to get results. And on an old BBS system, you could have, I think most of them were set for 256. 255 nodes, I'm sorry, 255 nodes in a network. Um, then you had to get into things like cross-networking, and, and that actually, it was not uncommon to get into the bigger cities where they had crossovers. So you'd have two BBSs sitting side by side. One would call the other, uh, and because they were in two different networks, um, one would call the other, this information got exchanged, this one, and then it felt back down that way. So, uh, yeah. Remembering the days of old. <sighs> I don't want to say computers were simpler then. Um, they were a lot more sensitive back then. Nowadays, you know, I don't want to say you can drop kick them. Not a good idea. But, you know, this is a hard drive. Um, hard drives back then are, you know, the big bulky ones. You see me pop up every one. This is, I don't want to say before laptops. Um... But laptops were just coming out around about that time. Um, and they didn't have laptop hard drives then. I think they had the big, bulky uh, three and a half inch ones like the desktops do. Um, but within a couple of years, they went to two and a half. So, but yeah, um, they weren't insensitive. Um, in the old days, just doing this, if you see me shaking it, just doing this in the old days um, was enough to ruin a hard drive. Um, you really had to handle them with care. Uh, not so much now. I can shake this, you know, if I drop it from a small distance, that's probably like four inches, um, it doesn't ruin it. It's got the protections built into it. The days of old, that $400 hard drive that probably only had enough memory on it to um, not even put an operating system on uh, would be completely and totally destroyed. Um, memory chips. Um, we're very prone to uh, static shock. Um, first computer I ever built was an old K6. Um, I want to say it was a 433 or a 567 megahertz. Not gigahertz. Megahertz. And I think I was pumping out a whole 256 kilobytes of RAM. Now those who are techie are like, oh, those who have no idea what I'm talking about, they're like, okay, trust me, 
in that day, this had more power than that AMD K6. Um, but yeah, back in the days, kids, you have no clue. No. You wouldn't, you know, you hear your parents talking about, you wouldn't survive in my time because we drank water from a hose. We actually went outside and played in the sun without sun sunblock. Yeah. Um, computer technology was no better. Um, you are not going to survive in our time. Um, you know, you might get away with an Atari, uh, Nintendo, uh, ColecoVision, but you're not going to have friends around the world. You're not going to be FaceTiming or Zooming or Discording. Uh, there is no Twitter. There is no Facebook. Um, plus side, though, for you, there's no online school. Um, but, yeah, there was none of that. None. Um, so, yeah, it was a whole different world back then. Even growing up in the 80s when I went to school in this area, um, it was all paper and textbook. Um, it wasn't be until I got to junior high in Bellevue, again, being a foster kid, uh, that I actually got to touch a computer. And even then, that computer lab was Commodore 64s. Um, my computer at the house at the time was a... I had a Commodore 64 and then went up to a Commodore Plus 4 not too shortly after that. Um, so yeah, um, technology, kids playing a game, go find and download some videos for Oregon Trail. There you go. Um, that's about the closest you're going to get. Otherwise, um, yeah, go do some research on Bree or on The Legend of the Red Dragon. Um, let's see, what was it with Trade Wars, the original? Yeah, you get 30 turns, you're done for the day. Go check your email, read your messages, sign off. And heaven forbid, your mom or dad picked up the phone while you were connected to a BBS. Because you know what would happen? Well, this.